Hello, ladies and gentlemen here in Davos and also our global audience online. My name is Mark Leonard. I'm the director of the European Council on Foreign Relations. And I'm very happy to be uh, moderating this discussion today on the future of global cooperation. I've been coming to Davos now for, I think, almost 15 years. And the idea of working together to solve global problems is part of the DNA of the World Economic Forum and has always been the leitmotif of most of the discussions which have taken place here. But this year, the backdrop to those conversations seems quite different. We are seeing a, a geopolitical takeover of the world with competition and conflict eclipsing co cooperation in many domains. And many of the discussions which used to be mainly framed around cooper cooperation seem to have taken on a different turn this year. If you look at discussions about the future of the global economy, there are as many about economic warfare as they are about eliminating trade barriers. If you think about the discussions about technology, there's a lot of talk about the, the battles between different blocks and different systems. Even migration is no longer simply about the search for global talent. There's talk about migration and people, desperate people being driven out of their homes, being turned into geopolitical weapons. And even when it comes to the, the most pressing global problems, such as COVID or climate change, we often see states competing with each other rather than coming together to help uh, further the survival of, of mankind. I don't think that there are any less global challenges for us to solve than there were in previous World Economic Forums, but the challenge of coming together to solve them is, is becoming more and more difficult. And that's really our, our topic today. I'm very happy to be presenting to you an all-star cast from different sectors and different continents to help us make sense of how we can have global cooperation in a world where there is more and more competition. I'll introduce them uh, to you briefly, and then we will go um, into uh, a discussion, and we'll end with some Q&A from, from the audience. Um, to my far left, we have uh, Sylvia Anna Ainio, who's a policy expert at the European Commission, where she leads uh, the international work stream on sustainable finance but she's also uh, the curator of the, the Brussels hub of Global Shapers and is gonna be talking about some of the work that Global Shapers have been doing on, on these issues of global cooperation. Sitting next to her is Lance Pierce, who is the chief executive officer of NetHope, which is based in the USA. It's a consortium of, of 60 leading non, uh, global nonprofits that represent 60% uh, of the world's aid funding delivered through NGOs. Next to Lance, we have Ilona Jabo de uh, Cavallo, who is the founder and president of the Igarape Institute in Brazil, which is a global think and do tank focused on physical, digital, and climate security. And she's also a young global leader. And last but not least, we have um, uh, Kyung Won Na, who is uh, the special envoy of the president of the Republic of Korea. She was a judge before she went into politics and has had a, a distinguished career as the first uh, uh, female chair of the, the, the Foreign Affairs Committee in Parliament and the floor leader. And we're very happy to have you here today, Mrs. Nam. So um, maybe we can uh, just start with this difficult situation that we're in at the moment where we have a whole series of global problems, but we seem to be moving into a more zero sum period of, of global politics. Um, Sylvia, do you want to, to kick off and, and tell us how you see things from your perspective? Sure. Thank you, Mark. So just to start with, um, I want to uh, introduce uh, the speech with facts. As the Global Shapers, which is a community of the World Economic Forum of uh, young leaders from all across the world, we have more than 500 hubs. What we have done during the COVID pandemic is we have worked on a youth recovery plan. We have realized basically that there were a set of topics that we wanted to understand how to tackle and what the youth thought about them. And of course, as policy leaders were coming across and trying to solve the issues of the COVID-19 pandemic, also we wanted to see what the youth had to say about it. We carried out more, a survey of more than 30,000 people all across the world. 
And one of the important findings that we got is that only 6% of young people actually want to run for office or think that politics can actually solve today's global issues. This is astonishing and it is, of course, um, a fact that we need to reason upon and we need to find a solution to. It might be linked to different uh, uh, set of mistrust and uh, also kind of disengagement towards the current political system. The good thing is, um, while this is happening on the one side, uh, we also found that the people that actually want to engage, let's say, in political entities, they want to do that at the multilateral level. So there's much more, uh, let's say, political systems and political organizations that, for instance, look at specific values, take climate change, which is a topic that I also work on, and they're cross-cutting. They do not look at the nation state anymore as like a basis to work with, but they rather look at common problems and how to tackle them all together. So I do believe that there is, of course, a very strong issue with restoring trust in existing political systems that perf perhaps they don't, do not really tailor anymore for the youth of today, uh, which is the findings that we got. But there is, uh, at the same time, uh, let's say, young generation that really wants to engage in value-based uh, politics and then wants to do that without looking at traditional partisanship, but rather going across that and really collaborating across countries. So this is the first important kind of funding I wanted to present to you. Thank you very much, Sylvia. But how do you reconcile the fact that power still uh, on a lot of the issues you talked about is being held by the national governments and parliaments that these people don't want to get involved with? They want to get involved with a, a system that's increasingly powerless to deal with the, the issues that we're talking about. I think the main issue is that political systems of today perhaps do not really cater anymore for the youth. And that's probably why the youth is not engaged uh, with them. One of the reasons might be that, uh, let's say, traditional uh, political campaigns, and we found that they require a certain amount of financing to start from. And that might be also an obstacle to, let's say, get the middle class, but also young generations to start these campaigns and to really engage. It is also linked to a question of representation and diversity. So how many actually diverse people we got currently in power in existing political systems. And I do believe that one of the key, let's say, actions that we need to do is to really sit at the table of political leaders at the national state and understand together with them what does it need to change at national level for, let's say, traditional partisanship to appeal. Because although you know, multilateral uh, groups, multilateral uh, entities are really important to solve global issues, we do need nowadays more than ever, given the current situation of re-globalization that we're looking at, uh, also national states, also political uh, leaders to engage at the national level and to be able to really uh, mirror these value-based movements that we, uh, as the young generation, so eagerly want to engage with. Okay. L Lance, you lead this coalition of some of the world's biggest NGOs that are dealing with a lot of the, the wicked problems at a global level. How do you see the, the, the situation? What, do you, what are your members telling you about their, the operating environment that they're, that they're in at the moment? Well, NetHope is, a, is a, as Mark said, a membership organization. We have 65 members uh, who work in over 190 countries around the world, uh, developed and developing. And uh, if you could uh, boil the issues down to the kind of the core themes that our members work on, there are things like persisting inequality, um, climate change, both on the mitigation and as well as on the, uh, the resilience side and uh, crisis response, which includes a number of the refugee crises around the world. And um, uh, for all of those issue areas, global cooperation is essential. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it's not possible to work on issues that increasingly uh, cross national borders, cross regional borders, unless you've got robust systems of cooperation. Um, and as noted, those are uh, really under pressure uh, in multiple ways around the world. So, um, you know, our members, as they look to prioritize the work that they want to do um, and the ways in which that they can continue to serve people and places, um, we need these systems of cooperation to really be able to, to allow access, to allow flows of aid, material, people, talent, and so on. And so, um, so there's, there's concern uh, among our members about the changing environment and concern about the ways in which they're going to be able to work in the future, especially as we look at a landscape where there are likely to be more crises rather than fewer. Great. 
So Ilona, you may, may be at the interface of the first two speakers because you work on lots of big global issues of the type that, that Lance was describing. But uh, you come from country Brazil where national politics has been uh, very much organized as a, a counter-revolution against some of the globalist forces that, that we're seeing. How do you uh, see these two uh, imperatives fitting together and, and what does it make you think about the future of global cooperation? Sure, I think we're, I think going into a multipolar world, which is always more unstable and just brings challenges, but also I think it's, uh, we have to recognize that this is a, a demand from many developing countries that we have a better redistribution. That said, I think we have several challenges to address there because even before COVID, we were seeing economic decoupling, supply chain decoupling, we're seeing this uh, uh, internet fragmentation possibility, splinternet. Uh, we're seeing the climate shocks that also, you know, just understand the interrelation. So COVID already tested multilateralism. And I would say Brazil, till very recently, was one of the biggest champions of multilateralism. And I hope we'll go back to that stage, because I think that there's no way out of that for the issues we face domestically, but also internationally. So I don't see, when I, when I look at all the discussions here, I totally understand the, the risks. I think we're living through an era of systemic compounding risks that will shape uh, every decision. But I don't see a way out of us to just go back to the table and try to find like really solutions based on diplomacy, based on cooperation. So I was recently invited by the UN Secretary General to just join his new board on effective multilateralism. And we have a big agenda in front of us. So from here, I'm going to Sweden for another presidential meeting and we're dealing with issues uh, from you know, uh, peace and security to climate to international financial institutions. So how can we think about improving governance on those issues? Because even if we're seeing fragmentation and distrust, uh, the only way for humanity and for the next generations to address what Silvia was saying is that going back to the table. So let's try that better. <laughs> like, let, let's try to do our best there. Great, thank you very much. Mrs. Nahr, you come from a country that's been very active on multilateral issues in the G20 and various other formats, uh, but you also find yourself in a part of the world that's increasingly caught between uh, wanting to have very close economic relationships with China but also having security relationships with the United States. So um, daily politics is, is about these two big blocks pulling you apart in, in different ways. How does that affect your thinking about global cooperation? Thank you for the question. Yeah. Uh, I will speak in Korean. Uh, Sorry, yeah. Uh, um, we, please, you. We've got yeah. headsets then. Yes, yeah. There are a lot of challenges in the uh, worldwide. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, 사실 그 아까 사회자께서 말씀하신 so the moderator, as the moderator has mentioned, the world is facing the challenges to achieve multilateralism. After the Second World War, we have pursued globalization, but after the the Lehman incident, Lehman incident, multilateralism has been declining, and the. Trump, President Trump of the U.S. and other uh, factors have just rattled multilateralism and the COVID-19 pandemic also did not contribute to multilateralism. Then the, does the world have to give up multilateralism? I don't think so. Korea has been a recipient of multilateralism, and we have grown thanks to multilateralism. This is a very important framework that the world has to work on. And how do we have to maintain multilateralism? Our new administration has taken office two weeks ago. So our new president, President Yoon Song yeol has this diplomacy vision, which is value-based diplomacy.
Of course, there are conflicts between countries, but there are other universal values that cannot be changed, like freedom, human rights, liberal democracy. So countries who share these common values have to come together for multilateralism. This is the key part of our value-based diplomacy. This can enhance the values of freedom, and this can also spread the value of freedom across the globe. It is not giving, about giving up multilateralism. We have to respect freedom and human rights, and countries who share the same values have to uh, gather together to bring more prosperity to the world. Thank you very much. Maybe we can use um, what you just said, Mrs. is not to, to pivot into a more of a kind of solutions-based uh, part of the discussion. And I, I think what you talked about there raises some of the big challenges that we're facing. On the one hand, you talk a lot about values-based diplomacy, but increasingly um, values are being seen as one of the dividing lines in the world. President Biden has tried to frame the war in Ukraine as a conflict between autocracy and democracy and have tried to, to rally the democratic world on one side to isolate Russia and China on the other side. But at the same time, if we're going to deal with climate change or COVID, um, these are unfortunately not global phenomena which recognize the borders between boundaries. Um, how do you build trust between countries that don't seem to share values, that are conflicting every day um, about basic norms, um, which have an enormous impact on our, on our global infrastructure. Um, how is it possible to, to have this values-based diplomacy, but also to, to try and find ways of, of working through those differences of values to, to come up with concrete solutions on climate, on COVID, on security issues, particularly when there is very little trust between countries. Yeah. Well, in that regard, I believe that the, it is very important to pursue the universal values, universal values, human human rights and freedom. This is very universal. Right now, the, there is a war in Ukraine and there are conflicts between the different countries. And even when they try to make response to climate change, they put their own interest before other countries' national interest. And because of that, a collaboration is becoming more challenging. So we have to go back to the universal values because of that. Uh, of course, the China has human rights issues, and uh, we turn a blind eye uh, to these human rights violations in Xinjiang, uh, China. It is because that the world has pursued profit and efficiency rather than freedom and human rights. But we have to go back to basics. This is the time. This is what the time calls for. What is the first reason Russia attacked Ukraine and why this, is, has, this has to be criticized, it is because Russia violated the freedom and human rights of the Ukrainian people. We have to focus on that fact, and we have to try to spread these universal values across the globe. Then the global citizens have to uh, benefit or have to enjoy uh, these universal values. That should be the direction. And if diplomacy and collaboration are based on these universal values, then uh, the rights of global citizenship uh, can be enhanced. Uh, that is what I believe. And when we talk about response uh, to climate change and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, I think the same logic should be applied. Uh, I'm here as a special presidential envoy of Korea. And when I uh, reported to the president of Korea, he told me that green technology that would be required to solve the good climate change, these green technologies are global common goods. This means that uh, we are talking about equitable access to vaccines and how to achieve net zero. So I'm not just talking about vaccines, but when we have these technologies, we have to view them as global common goods. This should be the approach we take because these technologies are essential to guarantee a decent life and the dignity of the mankind. We have to realize this 
respect, and if we just maintain this approach, we can solve a lot of issues. So I always say A, B, C, D, E. Society, global society or country, uh, we can make uh, buy in co cooperation in bio and health, climate change, digital economy, and energy transition. Thank you very much for that. Can I just ask one quick follow-up question before going on to the next? Because in a lot of those areas you're talking about, particularly around technology, that is where values often come to the fore. So when it comes to regulation of the internet, for example, how data flows. So increasingly, I think people are moving from an idea that maybe you have some global institutions with the universal values, but that a lot of regulations, particularly in, in these sensitive parts, which are so central to our everyday life and our democracy, are probably gonna be regulated more in, in smaller groups of like-minded countries and that values will actually lead to a fragmentation of the world rather than the coming together because there isn't the trust and the common values. And that leads to a very different idea from the kind of one world idea which is exemplified in the World Economic Forum's logo and in a lot of the discussions which have been had in Davos over the last few decades. Is that how you see things emerging? So, the question that you want to know about is that how uh, we pursue this globalization. That is what I think. So, we have to go back to basics. Up until now, if we go back to basics, then this uh, fragmentation, fragmentation of the world can be uh, solved if we just respect human rights and liberal democracy, then the, the world can be uh, gathered together based on these common values. How do you see uh, that dilemma, Ilona? So I would just say I agree that we have to go back to basics, but I would say the UN Charter, the Human Rights Declaration, that's the minimum. Country signed, it's there, but at the same time we need to reinvent and make multilateralism much more agile, inclusive, and able to deliver to the real needs of people. And unless we do that, and a, a good, uh, I think a, a good piece of information that you brought is that if young people really want to get involved in global questions, they might, you know, uh, pressure from another angle because what's happening today with the lack of regulation, for example, for the, the big technology companies with increasing polarization, disinformation, this is really, uh, like, I would say, undermining not only democracies but also social capital in general across the world. We don't trust each other. And I think, uh, to rebuild trust, we're gonna have to deal with like basic rules of the game, and there we have to be very principled because we cannot accept what's happening, like in, in the case of Russia and Ukraine. We're gonna have to include more voices in the global debate, and I do believe that it is also ring power countries because when I think about our political leaders, they don't only don't have domestic support for dealing with the global questions because honestly, this distrust, polarization, disinformation, misinformation, among, of course, inequalities, incapacity to deliver, growing angry, frustration. So, but one thing goes hand in hand with the other, and we have to work multi-level. So, but globally, let's go back to basics, but let's also reinvent, reboot multilateralism. And these will require more division of power, more plurality of voices, and it's hard, but it's the only way out. Cities, young people, civil society, business. So all the problem solving approach that we are saying, that has to be like based on task forces, problem oriented, and this will rebuild trust. But unless we agree to sit with different people and go problem by problem, you know, and then make a common agenda again for the world, we won't be able to move forward. Can I just ask you to go a bit more detail? Because you're talking about, on the one hand, empowering states, giving them a sense of control and sovereignty back, which is the, the sort of leitmotif of politics in lots of places, not least in Brazil, where people feel that their national governments are 
basically losing uh, any purchase on the future of their country because of global forces, because of things which are beyond their control. And at the same time, uh, you're saying that the solution lies in further diffusing power and getting yeah, big companies. Local and governments NGOs need to and... regain legitimacy with its domestic constituencies and do the right thing because today the what leaders are doing is just playing for the audience, playing for actually a small audience, generally in social media, that is shouting and not really paying attention to the majority in general mm -hmm. and to the real needs and to really the work has to be done. So like we need to be able to vote for leaders that can sacrifice re-election power for people. Like they are not serving their people, they're losing their, their constitution. So like it's if they can legitimize the role as leaders and really we have also to work with the possibility of like uh, uh, dealing with this, uh, I would say uh, epidemics of this information, then we can have a way out. So this has to go hand in hand, but I don't see a way of uh, a way out for any country to deal with the problems we have today in their own. So unless they really want to collapse internally, they're gonna have to engage multilaterally. So it's not, a, I don't think we can do it in different times, like things have to go hand in hand. And I do believe when I listen to what's going on, like honestly, when I talk to indigenous leaders, when I talk to younger people, I'm a former young global leader, not a young global leader anymore, but I still make, you know, have my connections like with, with different constituencies. There's so much human capital willing to go back to work together, we cannot have leaders that uh, just don't don't respect the basic rules that we have set to the world. And of course, we need just to repack this into more inclusive organizations, but we have to go back to basics in, the, in that sense of like, we have the shared values there. Let's go back to the UN Charter. Let's go back to the Human Rights Declaration. Then we build from there. Okay, I'm feeling a bit less old now. I'm also a former young global leader. Ah, I you see. You were real... <laughs> <laughs> Lance, you were lo nodding a lot while Elona was speaking. How do you see things? Yeah, and uh, several people have sort of mentioned the uh, the internet and kind of the new digital diplomacy that options that are out there, and you know the um, the the legacy structures of multilateralism um, today don't, um, don't yet sort of include the full range of possibilities made available by digital. I should say that NetHope was founded as an intentional partnership between the humanitarian and conservation sectors and the tech sector. So that's, that's in fact what we do. We work on partnerships on digital, on data initiatives across the whole range of our member organizations. And so I think the digital commons that increasingly make it possible for us to communicate across great, great distances, to collaborate in ways that we couldn't have imagined before, to parse data uh, at a scale that we, we couldn't have really uh, imagined uh, only a few short years ago. Um, all of those areas, uh, I think you're gonna see creeping sort of into the new multilateralism, and of course the UN, sec the UN is working on the um, the uh, the uh, the uh, digital um, um, uh, the digital compact yes uh, that is expected to be rolled out in 2023, and um, you're going to see more I think of these uh, sorts of uh, protections and standards and expectations and even values kind of rolling into some of the new frameworks that are are uh, beginning to take place. Um, and, and that's important because um, it, it, you know, as you mentioned, you know, increasing forces of fragmentation, uh, the things that pull us apart. Um, you know, many countries uh, are shutting down the internet, literally shutting down the internet in, in, in advance of key elections, in advance of public debates, in advance of policy decisions. Um, and this is not an isolated incident. It's happening increasingly in various parts of the world. So uh, it's not something that uh, people um, in, uh, in, uh, see everywhere, but it is a phenomenon that's real. Um, and advocates are really working to make sure that people do have access to this, this resource that uh, it really brings us all together in new ways. So um, I, I would say look for more of, of that kind of um, 
digital thinking uh, moving closer to the center of the kind of the reinvented multilateral frameworks that we're going to have to see in a world where the climate is changing, in a world where opinions are shifting, in a world where people are moving across borders in unprecedented ways. Um, and the internet's going to be one of the things, and, and, and our ability to use and understand data are going to be key to helping manage all those things. And I think you're going to see that migrating more to the center of those frameworks. Uh, quick follow up on that. I just think we cannot forget that the like big part of the world is not connected yet. Yes, that's so correct. So that's very important to address because I, I mean, where there's the bulk of young people, Africa, we need to include them digitally in this world. I mean, other parts as well, but I think we have just to make that. Uh, point here that absolutely. we need to, to also democratize the, the access to, to the digital world for a people. Absolutely. Yeah. Almost a little, uh, almost half the world is not connected. Yeah. And so, we're, so we're not able we to take to. advantage. So in my country, we're, we're working like to bring uh, digital connectivity for like remote areas in the Amazon so people can also, I, I think that there will be a revolution there. That's why we don't have yet <laughs> so much connection in terms of people also. And of course, we have to take digital literacy and all sorts of even financial literacy for people that uh, will have that access. But just to, to you back, Mark. So, Sylvia, how do you think multi multilateralism and global cooperation could be reinvented? So, we've talked about effective multilateralism, and we talked about as well um, value-based diplomacy. And I would argue that we then need value-based politics. Um, but what does that mean? Like, how can we make it concrete? Um, one key example that is very concrete, you know, that is not only words out there, is Europe. Because if we go back to history, let's not forget that Europe was a project of peace. The motto and the way in which Europe was created is united in diversity. This is like a project that started from values between countries that were at war with each other. That's what we're seeing today as well. We're seeing a situation where in front of a crisis, in front of a war, some countries are united around certain values. The values of today are solidarity and democracy. And I argue that without solidarity and democracy, there is very little space then for actually the other values to be built. And there's little space to, let's say, move towards other common goods and work towards you know, preserving the environment, fighting climate change, fighting future and current pandemics, and many other challenges of nowadays. And we talked about the internet, and we talked about you know, democratization of the internet. That is key in the sense that starting from agreeing on democratic values, this is the first point, let's say, to then believe that actually uh, giving access to internet, not shutting down social media, giving you know, voices and representation of voices, space to actually be heard, is the first step for then you know, democracy to evolve. And democracy is evolving around you know, the social media. We've seen all the movements that I've talked about beforehand, so these global multilateral movements, um, which are from Fridays for Future, but also, if you want, the Arab Spring, originated from social media, originated from access to information. And that is because there was a belief or at least, you know, a movement towards democratization. If we do not have democratization first, I argue that it's very difficult to then move towards other common values that we're talking about. And this is possible indeed, as I said, because we've done that in the past. We've done that, of course, only among a certain pool of countries. We're not talking about a global uh, set of democratization of countries, but we've done that among countries that were at war with each other in the past and decided that peace and democracy were going you know, before their, com their single interest towards a glo uh, global common interest, a global public good. Thank you very much. I'm about to open it up for questions and comments from the audience, but I think you wanted to say something first, Mrs. Mark. Yeah, I no. So everyone is talking about politics and their politicians are doing bad, so I feel responsible as a politician. So you talked about democratization of the internet and access to information. So we are talking about the crisis of multilateralism and not just crisis right now. We already have the gaps between generations and between different regions. And I understand the anger of the younger generations toward politicians. Internet is a tool to spread information, I agree. But sometimes internet is a channel to increase 
conflicts and tensions between different generations and between different classes and between different regions. If you look at the internet system like Facebook, Instagram, and other social media channels, if you look at YouTube, then they are using algorithms to show contents that, is, that are just tailored to specific preference of users. And this radicalizes users. And this is also the trend of social media. People just see what they want to see and believe what they want to believe. So along with the democratization of the internet, we have to think about ways how we can deduce these factors that causes and increases tensions and conflicts between generations. I think this is another challenge that we have to overcome. Thank you very much for the very important point about how all of these forces seem to be double-edged. All of the positive uh, sides of globalization seem to have a, a kind of uh, evil double um, and a dark side as well. Um, I'm now going to, uh, we've got about 10 minutes left for, um, uh, for, for questions and comments from the audience. If people want to put their hands up to, to raise something and uh, hopefully we can bring a mic. There's a gentleman in, in the front row. If anyone else wants to put their hand up, uh, a lady over there, maybe you could give her a mic as well so she can come in. Uh, thank you. My name is Saeed uh, Mohammed. I'm from Oman. Uh, I have a question for now. Uh, when it comes to uh, global values such as freedom, human rights, some argue that there is double standard. And they give the example of the, the current conflict, Ukraine, where the West actually stood uh, by Ukraine, uh, giving its support, military support, uh, financial resources, and all kind of other supports. And with, when it comes to other occupations, the world is quite silent and nobody talks about it. So how do you respond to such criticism? Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a lady here in the, in the third row. Thank you. Uh, my name is Naoko Ishii, the uh, Director of the Center for Global Commons at the University of Tokyo. My question for the panel, maybe particularly maybe a lady from Brazil, is that uh, when you talk about let's go back to the table, who is actually going back to the table? I assume, just based on the conversation, it's not just a representative nation state. You may be looking at much broader that a body of representing values. So then that uh, if we don't want to see the multilateral institution, which is not necessarily functioning too well, maybe the world is quite a kind of a complex world that representing those groups, it representing those values, issue by issue, or value by value. So how you see the governing structure of this uh, uh, new world of, you know, multilateralism coming about. Okay, are there any other comments, or if we have one more here in the in the second row? Thank you. I'm Hattie Samosir from Indonesia, um, Global Shaper Burn Hub, the coming creator. So it's mentioned before that a big part of the world is not connected yet. So what we can do as the young people, the the future generation to create universal values so do we have common understanding to solve the issues that we, we mentioned before. Thank you, appreciate it. Okay, thank you very much. So we've got three uh, really great questions there, one about Western double standards, one about how, you, how do you govern uh, this world of, kind of different values, and then finally how to, how to connect people. Um, do you want to go first, Mrs. Noah? And we take, don't feel you have to answer all of them, but answer as many as you can in about 90 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Who starts? Maybe start. Do you want to yeah. start, Mrs. Yeah. Noah? Yeah, oh, well, do you want to start? Why don't you start, Elena? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'll go to Naoko. So that's precisely what we aim, like very humbly, to, to just uh, give ideas in a report that will be launched in February 2023 of the High Level Advisory Board on Effective Multilateralism. But the way we see is that, of course, we have to go beyond international cooperation, state level cooperation, and really think about the ways, for example, the, uh, for even the UN to reinvent its capacity to, to absorb what's coming like from be a place like the World Economic Forum, be the amazing like uh, innovations that come out of cities, be citizens that are already working task forces, very local but very problem oriented that could have ideas to scale up, 
So we are really like thinking broadly. Like we know there are like, of course, uh, member states that will continue to, to be there and that will be hard also to break the, let's say, uh, power, power uh, struggle, but we have to make it more inclusive. Otherwise the system will implode because there are many issues already happening on the floor that are not being absorbed by the system. So we hope to come with great ideas, <laughs> hopefully, in February 2023 to respond more precisely. But we're looking at many options. And just a quick question on, on the connectivity one. I think uh, the young people that already have the connection needs to be very, like a, the, the solidarity has to be really increasing and we have to push into <coughs> Unfortunately, at the moment of so many com like compounding risks and priorities, we have to look at the ones that are not there because that will change the world. And I think for a better future that we have today. Okay, great. Would you like to go next, Mr. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 지금 말씀하시는. When I listen to remarks of other panelists and the questions from the audience, of course, uh, there should be a priority and we have to focus on the biggest risk and threats first. So Korea is caught between China and the U.S. that was mentioned by our moderator. And I believe that the Korea has not played a role that befits the economic status of Korea. So we have to do more. That's the realization of the new Korean government. So two weeks ago, our new president took office, and in his inauguration speech, he mentioned the word freedom 35 times. So he wants to spread this value of freedom across the globe. Of course, Korea is already a liberal democracy, but he wants to expand this value across our uh, society and across the international globe, and we will make bigger contribution to the world so that this value can be spread across the globe. We are ready to take on a bigger role in the international community. We will take more interest in the issues across the globe. Thank you very much. Lance, do you want to go next? Sure. I, th I think um, inclusivity is a theme perhaps that runs across all three of those questions. Uh, I mean, to the gentleman's question about the double standards, you know, there are crises playing out around the world now in Tigray, in the Venezuelan refugee crisis, in, in, um, in uh, uh, Southeast Asia, in Myanmar, and other places that don't get nearly the, the kind of attention that they deserve. And I think we, we've got to have an uh, multilateralism that addresses um, with with equity systems that arise wherever they arise in the world. We have to, uh, otherwise it, it won't be a multilateralism that'll be accepted unless it can do that. Um, and I think Naoko asked the question about, you know, who's at the table? And, um, you know, that's partly the role of civil society is to bring people to the table to make sure that they're represented in forums where they can't always be represented. Um, and unless, civil society can do that unless governments can do that more effectively, then um, they won't be seen as legitimate yeah. because they have to represent the, the voice of the, of the people to the best possible way they can. Uh, and I think the final question about connectivity is really gonna be key to that. We're in a world now that it is, there, there are more people in the world than ever before. And unless we are going to find ways to really uh, new ways to communicate and find what brings us together as opposed to what divides us, um, then um, we're not going to be able to, um, to, to survive in all of the change that's coming. Uh, we have to find ways that, um, to find those things that, uh, where we have more in common uh, as, as opposed to the things that drive us apart. We can always find things that separate us. Um, we're going to have to work a little harder to find the things that bring us together because that's the way we're going to actually uh, get successfully the, the, uh, through the, the changes that are coming. Great. Thank you very much. Last word to, to you, Sylvia. Thanks. So one of the key kind of outcome from this discussion that I'm thinking about is really that I would like to, to sort of argue that we cannot avoid uh, for multilateral institutions, but also multilateral youth organizations as well, to engage with the current system if we want to change things. Meaning, what we need to do is, of course, we need to be offered a seat at the table, but we also need to fight for it in a way. Um, because this youth mistrust, let's say, in global politics, in national politics, rather, it's, it's something, indeed, 
concerning, deeply concerning. But the only way to change this is for the global multilateral organizations that we work with, that we engage with, that the youth wants to be part of, that have specific value-based type of policy and politics, to engage with you know, the current policymakers in order to bring the value, to bring the issue there and to engage in a discussion at that level. If we, if we don't do that, if we just you know, sit around the table in a beautiful multilateral entity or institution that, however, does not have maybe the same level of decision-making power and argue about how we all agree around global, global public, public goods such as climate change, that poses an issue in really then having a transformational role um, within the current system. So to change the current system, we can you know, indeed gather in multilateral entities and, and organizations, but we got to make the two talk in a way. So I would argue for that. Okay, well, thank you very much to all of you for, for shedding so much light on a, a world that is uh, very dark uh, at the moment. It's been a really fascinating discussion. Maybe you can join me in uh, marking uh, our respect for the panelists in the traditional way. And I wish you all... Uh,